Welcome to the July 2021 Triangle Association of Freelancers meeting. We're glad to see you all here. And uh, I think everybody's been here before, so I'm not going to go through all the pieces of how to use Zoom. I think we've all gotten used to that to a certain extent. And uh, but if, as you have questions for our speaker, please put those in the um, chat and then I can ask him those when we get finished here. Okay. And tonight we have our illustrious leader, Don Vaughn, who will be speaking about the art of interview. And as we know, as a 44 year veteran of um, freelance writing, he's done a lot of interviews. So I think he has a great deal that we can learn from him. And I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Don. Thanks, Drew. And it's true, I have done a lot of interviews over the course of my freelance career, probably hundreds of individuals in all walks of life, famous people, infamous people, just regular people. And I've enjoyed talking with all of them. This is absolutely my favorite part of freelance writing is the interview, talking to interesting people, picking their brains, and then being able to share what I learned with my readers. But over the course of my, my freelance career, I've picked up a few tips on how to conduct an effective interview, how to get the most out of your source, how to make the experience comfortable for both yourself and the person you're talking to. And that's what I wanted to share with you all this evening. Um, there's a variety of different kinds of interviews that you're going to do over the course of your career. Most of them are what I call data dumps, meaning you are merely soliciting information and opinion from an expert on a particular topic. This might be a service article like interviewing a, 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 a carpenter on how to build a deck, for example, and he'll give you all this information you need on how to build a deck, you turn around, write it for your readers. There's also personality profiles and just profiles of interesting people. Those require a bit more depth and complexity in the interview itself. And there's a lot of inf uh, types of interviews where you really need to do a deep dig on, your, on the subject you're talking about and the person you're talking to. So depends on what kind of article you're writing as to which kind of interview you'll be conducting. But at the end of the day, they're all essentially the same in that you're having a conversation with another person on a topic of interest. Now, the few things to start, uh, to begin with to start are, I would always encourage you to record all of your interviews, whether they're five minutes, whether they're three hours, you wanna put these talks on tape either record it through Zoom or record it on a recorder, but you wanna have those words down. And that's because it's good for you and it's good for the person that you're talking to. It benefits you in that you have all the information you need. You can listen rather than merely hear. You can take notes, but you don't have to uh, focus on those. Instead, you're concentrating on the conversation. That's most important. It's good to, for your source also, though, because they're confident that they're not going to be misquoted because you have their words on record and you can turn to them and give their quotes verbatim. So that's the value of recording your interviews. And you want to transcribe those interviews relatively quickly if you can, while it's uh, still fresh in your mind. Um, that's, this is my least part of freelance writing is the actual transcription of it. But there are some options if you don't want to do it yourself. I know that there are platforms that you can download a WAV file of an interview and it will be transcribed for you. And there are also companies and individuals that you can pay to do the transcription for you. I personally prefer to do it myself and I transcribe, I would say perhaps 85% of a given interview, the remaining 15 is, is just stuff that isn't pertinent to the thing I'm writing about, so I don't need to have that down. So you definitely want to record it. Equally important is making sure that you have all of your questions in front of you at the time of the interview. Do not try to wing an interview because almost certainly you will forget on a very important question. So you wanna make sure that you have your questions in front of you. And I would encourage you to block the questions that you have by topic or by category or by some way that allows for a smooth transition from topic to topic. And this benefits you in that it keeps your, your source, the person you're interviewing on topic um, and they can focus on that rather than having their thoughts over here, then over there, then coming back to this. They can focus on that particular topic. That makes it easier for them. It makes it better for you. So you want to make sure that you have all of your questions. 
Now, before you write your questions, I strongly encourage you to do as much research as necessary on the subject you're talking about, but also the individual that you're talking to. This is really important in that um, it, it will inform both the course of the interview and the questions and the tone of the questions that you write. Um, the more you know also by doing this preliminary research, you will answer a lot of easy questions that you don't have to ask during the interview and that will save you some time. You don't wanna waste time on questions that you can answer other ways. But by going back and researching your interview subject, you're knowledgeable um, and that person is confident that you know what you're talking about. Um, as an example, today, um, today, for example, I wrote up the questions for an interviewing I'll, interview I'll be doing next week with a film festival programmer named Bruce Goldberg, and, uh, or Goldstein. And I, I knew of Bruce, but I didn't know very much about him. So I went in and I did a lot of research and really dug deep into his career as a uh, film festival programmer. And he has done much, much more on top of that. So I have a lot of really interesting questions for him. And I'm looking forward to that interview. And had I not done my interview, if I just written some general questions, the, con the conversation would not be as good as I know it will be. Um, so uh, at that point, we're ready to go. Um, um, you have it written down and research. An example of the research, though, um, I like to do celebrity interviews, and I've done a number of them over the course of my career. And one of the, the earlier ones in my career was with an actor named William Shallert, uh, a name not familiar to a whole lot of people, but if you saw his face or heard his voice, you would recognize him immediately. He did a tremendous amount of work and made a lot of really interesting movies. And I did a lot of research on William Shallert's career, the films he was in, the TV series he was in, the directors he worked with, the other actors he worked with. So I had a very good understanding of William Shallert's career going in. And over the course, he had a lot of great stories to tell, but then there were movies that he made that he had virtually no memory of making, absolutely none. It was a one day job, he had one line, and it was completely forgettable. He had no memory of that. And midway through our conversation, he stopped and he said, you know, Don, you know more about my career than I do. And I realized then that doing the research I had done was a very good thing, and the interview came out really wonderfully. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about specific points of an effective interview. Before I get to that, though, I want to talk about technology. I use a digital recorder at this point, and what I do is I put my, I call the individual on my cell phone, I put my cell phone on speaker, and I put the phone next to my digital recorder, which also has an external mic. Looks like this. Okay, so turn on the tape recorder. Put the microphone next to the phone, phone's on speaker, and we're ready to go. Um, I would encourage you to always double check your technology before the beginning of an interview. Make sure you have extra batteries. If you're using an analog tape, which I did until very recently, make sure you have additional tapes. Make sure that you have redundancy on everything. And this is especially important if you are interviewing on site rather than over the telephone. There's nothing more embarrassing than having your tape recorder die while you're talking to somebody at their location and you can't continue because of that. So always check your, your technology. Um, and also make sure too that you have sufficient time to conduct the interview. And if it appears that you don't, towards the end, ask if you can schedule a follow-up interview to finish up with the questions that you have. Sometimes an interview will go super long um, unexpectedly. And so you may need to reschedule a second part of that. Sometimes you may have a source who is really verbose. Um, I, uh, for example, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I had the honor and privilege of talking to for a, a military officer magazine. I had 20 questions. I asked seven of them because Neil deGrasse Tyson is incapable of a brief answer and it admitted to that. So you wanna make sure you have sufficient time for your interviews. Um, one particular aspect of the interview is the emotional component. Um, where appropriate. Not all articles require an emotional component. If you're doing the service article on how to build a deck, obviously that's not part of it. But if you were talking to an individual specifically about an experience that individual has been involved in, very often their emotional state is a very important component to the story they have to tell. But people generally, we're not programmed to reveal that about ourselves unless we are asked. So you're going to have to go out of your way 
to ask a particular question for, the, uh, for an emotional component. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Say, for example, that you're interviewing a, a motorist whose car stalled on railroad tracks and his car was hit by a train and miraculously he survived. You could say, so tell us what happened. You saw the train coming, what happened? And the guy will say, well, I looked over and I saw the train coming and I tried to get out of the car, but I couldn't. And the next thing I know, the car train hit the car and I woke up in the hospital. Okay, that's the basic facts of the story, but it is not very interesting or very compelling. But if you ask the individual, tell me what was going through your mind as you saw that train bearing down on you. What kind of emotions were you experiencing? What was going through your mind at that moment? I've never prayed so hard in my life. I realized I was never going to see my family again. I absolutely was certain I was going to die. Now, which is the better quote? Obviously the second one, but you would not get that kind of intensity of reaction if you hadn't specifically asked. So you wanna make sure that where appropriate, you step ahead and ask that question. And this also brings me to a side aspect of this, and that is occasionally you may find yourself having to take off your writer hat and put on your compassionate human being hat because things will trigger people sometimes, and it may be a negative reaction that they experience. Um, they may burst into tears. They may become angry. You don't know how people react to a specific situation, but you need to be ready for that. And as an example, in 1991, um, Hurricane Andrew devastated the exotic bird industry in South Florida, just annihilated it. It was horrific. It was a, one of the worst hurricanes uh, Florida has ever experienced, and the, re the results were just devastating. I got a call from Bird Talk magazine asking me if I would talk to a bird breeder who had lost almost her entire flock. She had nothing almost nothing and kind of get her perspective on what was going on. And I did. They called her on a cell phone that was losing power rapidly. She had lost almost all of her breeding stock. She was putting three and four birds in cages designed for one because of, of the destruction of, of her facility. Um, she realized she didn't have sufficient insurance and everything was crashing down on her. And here I am a journalist asking her questions from a business perspective which to her credit, she answered very, very professionally up to a point. And there was a point when the reality of her situation just dawned on her and she broke, she just fell into tears. She just started sobbing. And so I took a moment and I turned off the tape recorder and I said, it's okay, let's, let's just talk for a minute. And we just had general conversation about nothing at all until she felt a little bit better and she collected herself and I turned the tape recorder back on and we con continued our conversation. So I want you to be aware that that is always a possibility and you need to be ready for it. Um, it has been my experience that the best interviews are easy interviews, meaning a casual conversation between two individuals. Um, and if you're doing it, whether you're doing it by phone or in person, this is absolutely true. A good interview is like a gentle raft ride down a river where you're conversing and back and forth, question and answer, question and answer until you get to a gentle end and you get off the ride and you've got what you want and your source has given you everything they have and you're ready to write the article. And so that's why everything I've told you so far is so important, having your questions in front of you, recording it so you can listen rather than merely hear, doing the research in advance so you are knowledgeable about the topic. All of these things come into play in making sure that this conversation is easy for you as it is for the person you're talking to. This means not interrupting. Um, and giving the individual a moment to collect their thoughts, especially if they haven't seen your questions in advance. Um, you don't wanna rush into something, you don't wanna interrupt, you don't wanna offer your thoughts first because that might color their response to your question. Let your source speak, let them talk, let them collect their thoughts for a minute and then you can move on to the next question. You don't have to interrupt. Um, but that said, sometimes people will go off on a tangent and then it's your responsibility as the interviewer to take them by the hand and bring them back to the sidewalk. You know, and very often that tangent will not be 
to what you're, you're going to be writing about. It's a waste of your time. So you need to break in at an appropriate point and bring them back to the topic at hand. That said, sometimes bombshells will land in your lap, something really unexpected you hadn't anticipated, something you really need to jump on and ask additional questions about. Now, if you're recording, that is easy to do. You're listening. You're listening to the questions. You might be taking a handful of notes, but you've got your tape recorder going so you really can listen and you're ready to react when someone drops a bombshell in your lap. You're ready to ask some follow-up questions. Um, make sure that you understand what your source is saying and don't hesitate to ask the same question a number of different ways until you get the answer that you need. Um, and this is really important, especially if they're at, answering monosyllabically, which is an interview nightmare where you have a source who is just, you know, answering with yes or no's and very short single sentence um, um, answers. And so you need to ask the question however different ways until you get the response that you're looking for, the information that you need. Um, sometimes that's as simple as just saying, could you please elaborate on that point for me? And that is a good response to a monosyllabic answer because it forces them to talk at length about, about what it is that you need to talk about. Um, and also, if you're doing a technical interview and you're not an expert on the subject, don't hesitate to ask for clarification on points you don't really understand. Although usually you can go to Google you know, and kind of get some background information if you need to. I do this often with the veterinary interviews that I conduct. There's a lot of technical medical jargon going on. I don't want to inter uh, interrupt the flow of the interview by asking them about this or that. So I'll make a note and I'll go back and look it up. But sometimes after the end of a sentence, you can go ahead and say, can you tell me a little, what is that? What does that do? What does that mean? What is the mechanism behind that particular function? Whatever it is, because you need to understand this in order to turn around and convey it to your readers. And if you don't understand it, then your article is, is going to be a nightmare. So don't hesitate to ask for clarification when necessary. Don't jump in during moments of silence. As I said, give your, your, your sources a moment to ruminate on their answers. Um, but it's OK to gently guide them in there, you know, if they take a little bit too long. Um, and, and sometimes you got to be prepared to ask your question twice because they'll get into an answer and they'll stop and they'll go, what was the question again? And it's embarrassing if you can't remember what the question was. Um, if you're interviewing in person, it's always a good idea to take notes of the surroundings of where the interview is taking place. Say you're interviewing a, a researcher at NC State about some really interesting research that they're doing. Um, if you go into the lab, take some notes about what the lab looked like, what it smelled like, the stuff on the tables. Same with what if you're in the, his office, are there pictures on the desk, are there pictures on the wall? You know, again, what are the surroundings? This kind of information adds color to a profile um, and can be very revealing too about the individual that you're talking to. And sometimes this can lead to additional questions. You know, if they've got something unusual on your desk, feel free to ask about that, what it is and what it means to them, because it could be very revealing, could be very enlightening and very insightful about that particular individual. Now, sometimes we do interviews by email. And I like interview emails up to a point. They have their pros and they have their cons. If you were just doing a simple data collection, then that is where email interviews are especially effective. You can just, you know, you, this is the information you need. These are the questions you ask to get that information. You send it off to your source. They respond in writing and you're ready to go. And email interviews are great because you don't have additional transcription time. And you can usually go back after you get the responses, you can go back with a follow up email for additional information if you want to. You need to make sure, though, if you're dealing, doing this corporate um, and in other scenarios that the person that you think is answering your questions really is that it's not just their secretary or the PR person with the particular organization. You want to make sure that the expert is the person who is answering it because they are the ones to whom the information will be attributed. Um, so those are benefits. I like, I like uh, um, um, email interviews, um, but they don't allow for immediate follow-up questions, which can sometimes be problematic. So it's up to you to decide whether or not you know, a, an email interview is appropriate for what you're writing and the kind of research that you're doing. Um, 
a lot of people have difficulty bringing a interview to a conclusion. You know, it's like, as I said, you're on this raft trip um, or think of it as a gentle train ride and you get to the end of the ride and it's like, how do you stop the train so everyone can get off? And I've developed a number of, of easy ways. I thank the individual, um, say, you know, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for your time. The information you've given me has been wonderful. Are there, is there anyone else you would suggest I talk to? on this particular topic. And if Dr. Jones gives me another name, then that makes that interview a bit easier because I can go to them and say, Dr. Jones gave me your name, suggested I talk to you. I talked to him and he thought you might be able to help me with this article. And almost always they will say yes to that because you have Dr. Jones behind you. He was the introduction. Um, so that's a good way. Um, I'll ask them who else I can talk to. I'll ask them if there's any additional information that our readers should know that has not been addressed in my questioning. That's another good way to bring it to a conclusion and get off the telephone. Um, a variety of different ways. It depends on who the person is and, and, and other factors. I would also encourage you in most instances to try and get on a first name basis with the person you're talking to as quickly into the interview as you can. Because when you're on a first name basis with somebody that establishes a particular level of trust and intimacy, and they will feel more comfortable talking with you, they will feel more comfortable with the interview process in general, um, and will be more open in their responses if you call them by their first name and encourage them to do the same to you. Now, if I'm talking to a doctor, I interview a lot of veterinarians, unless they respond to my emails with their first name, I will call them Dr. Jones or Dr. Smith or whatever their title is. Uh, the same with military people that I speak with. If they uh, respond by a first name, I'll do that. Otherwise, it'll be General Smith or whatever their title might be. Uh, people will talk to you for a wide variety of reasons. You know, researchers will want to talk to you to give voice and, and bring light to the research that they might be conducting, possibly stuff they've been working on by themselves, you know, or, or quietly for years and have never gotten any publicity about it. Somebody might want to, you know, uh, bring light to an organization or a, uh, a, a, you know, some social justice issue that's really important to them. But uh, mostly people will talk to you because they enjoy seeing their names in print. They enjoy seeing their names in a magazine or in a newspaper. For us, it's a job, but for most people outside of our profession, it's a genuine thrill to see your name in a national magazine. And I have found that to be, for the most part, the most common reasons that people agree to talk with me. And for the most part, aside from the president and the pope, almost everybody is gettable. Almost everybody is gettable. Most of the time when I've reached out to prominent names, the main reason that they haven't, that they were unable to talk with me was a scheduling conflict more than anything else. Almost always they wanted to, but we simply weren't able to click. Only a couple of times over my career have I reached out to someone and they were very specific in not wanting to talk with me. And one of those instances was a doctor that I reached out to for an article I was writing for a men's magazine. It was Hustler. It was Hustler magazine. Um, I was writing, it was a legitimate article on a legitimate topic that could have run in any magazine, but it just happened to be for Hustler magazine. And this particular source was very upfront. He was very nice about it. He said, I just don't want to be in, in that magazine. And he said, if you do this topic for any other, please call me back. I'd be more than happy to you. But in this particular case, I, I'm going to have to decline. And I understood that. And that was fine. And when you do have sources that decline, in almost every case, there is a, another individual of equal caliber, um, of equal importance that you can turn to as, as a secondary for that. Um, that has been my case almost always. If I can't get Dr. Jones, I'll get Dr. Smith. If I can't get Dr. Smith, I'll get Dr. Adams. There is always somebody else in the queue who is just as good as that first person. Um, sometimes people will ask to review the article after it is written. I very often will send the manuscript or portions of the manuscript to my sources for a fact check. And you have to be very specific that they understand it is only for a fact check. This is not an opportunity to rewrite. You just want to make sure the facts are correct. But I've had, I've been involved in some horror stories of people who have wanted to do much more than that. One of them was the first articles I wrote for Nursing Spectrum, which was about the nurses who work with astronauts at NASA. 
And I talked to the head nurse there and I talked to a bunch of other nurses. And when I sent the head nurse the manuscript for a very quick fact check, she started rewriting other people's quotes. And we did not want that. Um, she was upset because other nurses were getting more, more words in the article than she was. And at the end, she actually said she was gonna pull it. And I just laughed and I said, this interview is done, this article is written and it's going in the way it is. And it did and there was no issues after that. So be aware that that might be a possibility. You might need to you know, um, deal with this um, politely, but most people understand a fact check is a fact check. And if a quote is awkward, I have no problem with them finessing a quote for readability and for clarity. I have absolutely no trouble with that. Um, so that's, that's my take on the art of the interview. I love this. I love interviewing more than anything, just going out to lunch and talking to people. It's one of my favorite things. And I really hope that it will be yours also. I know a lot of people, um, they're uncomfortable cold calling people to arrange interviews. Email makes that a little bit easier, but understand that you, at the end of the day, you're two professionals doing your job. You're a journalist reaching out to someone because you need information, and that, inf that person is an expert on that topic, and they will talk to you because of that. And more times than not, everything will go easily and very, very smoothly. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer that. Anything at all? Actually, hey, also, if you have, if you have uh, I'll do questions first, but I would also really like to hear any stories you all might have this evening on any uh, you know weirdness you've had during an interview or funny stories or an interview that went especially well. But before that, if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Hey, uh, Don, um, how do you uh, store your um, interviews? For example, if you wanted to uh, see an interview you did in 1991, could you uh, go back to that interview and, and find it? and uh, do you use like uh, the reporter's notebooks or do you use um, some other kind to keep your paper copy? Mostly it's the transcription of my interview that I keep. I do not, for the most part, I do not keep, I, like I said, I record on a digital, so I, I don't keep those interviews. I delete them out of necessity after I've transcribed it, but I try to transcribe as thoroughly as I possibly can. Um, and so the transcription is my record of the interview itself. And Edward, did you ask how I start interviews? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because it's, it's, the start of the interview is as important as the conclusion of the interview. And usually what I'll do is I'll start with a little, just a, a minute of small talk with the individual, if there's something we might have in common, whatever it is, our locations, whatever, just a minute to establish the briefest, most superficial of relationships. And then I will segue into my first question and, and we're off to the races. Um, but Edward, as far as your question, that's really it. I, I maintain a folder for every article I write and that folder contains everything from my pitch, my initial pitch to the editor, to my final contract after the whole thing is done and done. It has all my research materials. It has um, the transcription of my interview. It has my, my uh, contract. It has everything specific to that individual project. And I keep those, those I have. I've got boxes in my attic that are causing my house to creep because I've done so many of these things, but I hang on to that stuff. And I would encourage you to do the same also. Lisa had a question. Do you wanna go ahead and ask Lisa? Yeah, um, have you done interviews like using the Zoom function? This year I did my first. Um, I can't recall who it was with now, I'm sorry. It might've been a veterinarian, I kind of think it was. Um, I, I prefer phone over Zoom, but this individual wanted to do Zoom and I was fine with that, it was easy peasy. So what I did is I just took my recorder and my microphone and I put it in front of my computer speakers. It picked it up, the conversation fine. So it was, a, it was an easy and successful um, experiment. I don't mind doing that, but I just find phone a little bit easier. I wondered if like it was somebody like super famous, they might have pushback about doing that kind of an interview. I'm not sure. Well, uh, I haven't interviewed anybody famous by Zoom. Um, although I think it was uh, Gary Goldstein, the, the I mean, not Gary, um, uh, <laughs> um, 
Bruce Goldstein uh, suggested, uh, wanted to know if he wanted to do it by Zoom or by phone. And just for ease, I suggested phone. He was cool with Zoom. Sometimes they'll bring it up. And, and as I said, I'm happy with it. Um, celebrities might be a little bit more reluctant to do a Zoom interview for the reasons you suggested. You know, they don't want me looking into their house, you know, even if I'm just looking at a blank wall. And I understand that, you know, and I try to be respectful of the people that I interview. I thank them profusely. I would encourage you to do the same. And it's also really important that you follow through and make sure that the people you talk to receive comp copies of the issue in which that article appears. I mean, these people, I don't pay for interviews. Most magazines don't pay for interviews. Um, so really their payment is getting a copy of the magazine in which their words appear. And that's literally the very least you can do on their behalf, I think. Um, but I have had people who have been just absolutely ecstatic at the opportunity. Um, just recently, I interviewed uh, for Cure Magazine um, a man who had um, cancer of the throat and had lost his larynx. And his wife, Paula, also had had uh, cancer herself. And um, so I, I interviewed them about their individual stories. And Paula, because the, her husband was having difficulty talking because of his, his um uh, voice issues became the primary spokesman for their story and she was absolutely wonderful and she was so excited when the photographer the magazine hired a, a photographer to come to their house and take professional shots of them to go with it and that she she just emailed me and she was over the moon about that and I sent her a link when the article was published online I haven't gotten the print copy yet I sent her that and again she reached out and she was so effusive about the experience and that kind of reaction to an interview always makes me really really happy and she was very pleased with the article itself and that makes me happy also but you have to remember you're not writing the article for your sources if you spend a, an hour with somebody on the phone, that doesn't mean they're entitled to the lion's share of the words in your article. You might spend an hour on the line with them and use one sentence of their interview if that is all you have that works and all they have that is appropriate. Or you might spend 15 minutes with somebody on the phone, but they are such a knowledgeable source that they become your primary source in the article. So remember, you're not beholden to your sources to give them space in the article. Your job is merely to get information from them and let the article tell the story that it tells. Eliza, you had a question. Yeah, I was just wondering, I mean, I'm looking into getting into podcasting. So is there anything you would amend with that to tailor specifically to podcasting. For example, I mean, Zoom, especially being a podcast interviewee, that's primarily the way uh, these interviews have been, have been conducted is on Zoom, for example. But is right. there anything, do you think there's any, any modification or does, does your, for lack of a better word, techniques <laughs> apply um, in that well, in that I, particular I, medium, I would think that most of it would apply. Truthfully, Elisa, I have no experience with with podcasts, absolutely yeah. none. Um, but to me, an interview is an interview is an interview, whether it's through a podcast or whether it's through Zoom or whether it's over the phone or in person. At the end of the day, it's two people talking, really. And I think, you know, the advice I gave about doing your research and having your questions in front of you and, and, and all of that, I think still would play into that. I think that, you know, it, it's good for that as well. Um, and, and I mean, like an interview is an interview, you know, so yeah, I, I would think that it plays across all the platforms and all the media. Okay. I wish I had more experience with podcasts, but no, it hasn't been our thing yet. Arlene? Yes, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to sell my house and I'm going into a small apartment, delightfully. But I've got interviews from 20 years ago that were published in a book. Do I have to really keep all those records now? I've got all these records and I, I'm not going to have room for them. Well, you know, it's funny you should mention that because this fall, I'm actually going to be going up into my attic and I'm going to be throwing away the files for about the first 10 or 15 years of my right freelance writing career. Um, it's, it's just taking up too much space. I don't need it. There's nothing in those boxes. 
pardon me, that I need today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna clear it. Um, you might wanna keep some for sentimental value. There are certain interviews that I did keep um, that I, I kept um, a couple interviews with some prominent writers that meant a lot to me, just mm -hmm. again, for sentimental value for no other reason. But okay. I think really, unless aside from that, I don't really see a reason to keep um, uh, project folders longer than say 10 years. Um, okay. unless you feel that you may need to go back to them for some kind of ancillary project down the road. Right. But most of the stuff that I wrote that long ago, you know, I have no more use for. The exception, okay. oddly enough, is William Schaller, who I mentioned earlier, because I had done the interview for him a million years ago, and that was for Film Facts magazine. And he died a few years ago. I think he died in 2017. But I was just talking to Michael Urie, the editor of um, Retro Fan Magazine, which is a nostalgia magazine. And I said, let's do a profile of William Schaller. He was the original Mr. Television. And I explained to Michael his accomplishments. And he said, absolutely, we need to do that. So I'm going to dig up that particular file if I can find the box that it's in. But I've got that particular interview and article on my computer. So I mean, everything I need is right there. Yeah. But anyway, the short answer yeah. to your question, I think, is chuck what you don't think you'll need. I don't see any reason to bring it with you. Okay, good, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Are you keeping them in like big banker's boxes? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got a ton to my left over here. I do. <laughs> okay. I, I want to share something with you, Don. I was doing an interview. This was one of the early interviews that I was doing. And I had done my research on, on um, Google. I Googled the person and um, I found an unusual fact about them and I brought it up in the interview and the interviewer said, that's not me. That's somebody else that has the same name I have. Well, it was, it was uh, humorous to bo the both of us. I was very embarrassed at first, but um, I, I found it just interesting that even if you make a mistake and have something that you ask somebody about in an interview and it's not them, that it, it doesn't stop an interview. No, no, no. I'll tell you a, a, a horror story-ish. Um, uh, how many of you remember, <laughs> some of you won't, but many of you will remember an actress named Ann Southern. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, she's from an uh, a, a older generation, Rebecca. Actually, Ann Southern was a really big name in her day. She was a really, really famous actor, film actress, and she had a very successful television career. But when I interviewed her for Film Facts, this was long into the, the end of, of her career and everything. And I had done some research and I asked her her age and she gave me a number that did not jive with what I had found in other sources. And I did the stupidest thing in the world. I challenged her on it. Bad mistake. <laughs> She was livid and she just jumped on me like a rabid dog and we went round and round for 10 minutes. I realized immediately this was a fight I was not going to win. And so I tried to appease her as best I could and get the interview back on track. And we were able to do that. And once we started talking about her films and her television, she was absolutely delightful. And the rest of the interview was great. But I learned a really valuable lesson there. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other side of the coin, um, I was lucky enough to interview um, Tim Matheson, who most people know as uh, Otter in, in uh, Animal House. But he's done a ton of television, a ton of movies. And he was actually the voice of Johnny Quest when he was a teenager in the 1960s. And that was the hook that I reached out to him on the 50th anniversary of Johnny Quest. And he was he was he said he'd be happy to do that. Um, and so I interviewed him and he was, he was wonderful, an absolute delight, just a sweetheart of a guy, amazing stories, so, so nice. Um, we were about an hour into it. I had a handful of questions still to go. And he said, Don, I, I have to go. I'm sorry. I've got another phone call I have to make. I have to cut this short. Said, can I call you back when I'm done with the other call? <laughs> and I'm like, that would be wonderful. 20 minutes later, Tim Matheson calls me back. We finish our interview and it was absolutely wonderful. So my experiences with, with famous people have, have for the most part been very positive. I have found them to be just regular folk. Once you start talking about stuff, 
They're like your next door neighbor and nothing more to that. Um, and it's easy to kind of fan out on things like that. I tend to do that sometimes with writers that I'm, I'm enamored of, but you'll quickly realize that these people are no different from you, you know, you know, and they're happy for the most part to talk about the work that they've done. Does anyone else have any interesting stories about interviews? I really want to hear your side of it. Rebecca? No, well, no, I, I had a question. <laughs> not, not a oh, okay. Story, so <laughs> so sure. I was curious how you apply the, all these interview type things for fiction. I haven't so, yet. Yes. Um, well, the Reese, I have done super little research on my fiction at this point. Um, and I am so new to fiction that um, the opportunity to interview in support of my fiction has not come around yet. Um, it might down the road. Um, and maybe, you know, if I'm lucky, maybe I'll be on the other end of the tape recorder being interviewed rather than being the interviewer, which would be really interesting. But I, I no, it, it hasn't really played in yet. It's Rebecca, all the are, you, are you talking about inter like getting doing research for a fiction project yeah. and interviewing yeah. Oh, somebody? I'm sorry, Rebecca. No, oh, no, I haven't no, done any. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but I will tell you, it's funny you should mention that though, because you know one of the projects that I look forward to turning to after I finish Cannibal Cruise is a uh, a, a middle grade novel about the first daughter who befriends a ghost living in the White House. And that has a fantastical element to the story, but I will have to do some interviews um, to, to really understand the realities of life in the White House. And one thing I intend to do when the time is right is I would like to make an appointment with someone at the Raleigh Bureau of the Secret Service and go in and talk with them about their role with the first family. And I know there's a lot they're not going to be able to talk about because of security reasons, but I, I'm really interested in the depth of the relationship, how big the the force for like the first daughter would be, you know, how how um, into her life they go, that kind of stuff, you know, and because, you know, like I said, there's a fantastical element to this with the ghost, but the story, if I don't try and be as realistic as, uh, realistic as I can about the president and life in the White House, then the story falls apart and nobody, you know, it'll just be a joyless ride for the reader. So, you know, that will be an example, I think, of, of doing research in support of my fiction. Do you I look forward to that too. I think that'll be really interesting. Do you think you'll have as much ease with getting uh, folks, well, maybe not with the Secret Service per se, but getting folks to agree to be interviewed for fiction as, as for print magazine and that type of thing? I don't think it would be a problem. I think people would actually find that an uh, interesting approach rather than talking to a journalist for a nonfiction article. If I came in and said, I'm writing a novel for middle school children, it's set in the White House and the Secret Service is an important component of this. Can I ask you some general questions knowing there's a lot you can't tell me? And I would imagine that they would find that kind of a different, interesting, fun thing to do. I I've done hope. it. I've done it. I've not done it. I've not done it extensively, but I have talked to people and saying, I'm just not comfortable enough in this area. Can you just fill in some things for me? The most, the most research I did was the, the novel I just finished. It's in the hands of my agent right now. So I'm waiting to hear back. Um, uh, or it's being shopped, I should say right now. So I'm waiting to hear back, but I, uh, the protagonist is a is a music producer. She's a female music producer and and uh, audio engineer, and so I grew up around my brother, <laughs> you know, his whole life, and this is what he does. And I actually sat down with him and said, "I'm not your sister." <laughs> I said, "I want I want to observe you as ob as objectively as I could possibly do." So I asked questions that um again not not to assume that well i just know this about him because i i've grown up with him my entire life i actually asked some specific you know i had some pre-written questions i asked some specific things and i shadowed him for like a day or two i just watched him work which again i've done that so many times but i did it now in the role of novelist and observer and and um it was a great experience for both of us, actually. And and the best part is when I gave him a draft of the novel, he said, you nailed it. Awesome. So that was, 
<laughs> you do need to go to the, I mean, it's, you know, it's absolutely true though. If you, if you are not part of something, you don't understand it to the depth that you really need to, if you're going to write about it. And so that's why you really need to talk to people who are involved in the things that you don't know that much about. Um, and and I did a little bit of research on virology for cannibal crews, um, but just a tiny, tiny amount. I didn't actually talk to anybody. I just went online a little bit. Um, but I am hoping to talk to some more people uh, when I finally get to the, the ghost story. I don't have a working title for that yet, but that'll be real interesting. I'm looking forward to it. So Liza, is that something that you would credit somebody at the like at the end of the novel with um, being a being a source or or um, someone that you were able to talk to for that for information for the novel or I, I would I would say something in the in the acknowledgments special thanks to you know uh, mm -hmm. whoever for their time and teaching me about whatever I dedicated the novel to him so yeah. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, or half dedicated. I dedicated it to two people actually, but but half dedicated to him. Um, but yeah, I would do that in the in the acknowledgments. I would just say, um, you know, thank you very much. On the, on the topic of of subject knowledge, there's a horror writer uh, who goes by the name, or used to go by the name of, um, um, golly, what was her Poppy Z Bright. I don't know if that name rings a bell for anybody. She was a yeah. very popular horror writer, especially in the 90s. She kind of fell out of writing for a while and she actually got into restaurant work and became a, a, apparently a very successful chef with her partner. And her most recent novel is about a person who works in the restaurant business. And it, it's actually a, a very, very important part of the story. And so she obviously turned around and, and dug into her experience as a professional restaurateur and all of that. And it really made the, the book much, much better and really informed everything. You know, so I, I, obviously you can't have fast stuff like that because the reader will know. You know, we've all read books where like, this makes no sense at all. I don't think that's exactly what would happen here. You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, that, that's where research comes in handy. And if you're a journalist like I am, though, being able, having developed these interview skills over a number of years, you know, then I'm very comfortable reaching out to people and asking them if I could spend a minute on the phone with them to talk about a particular subject for a piece of fiction that I'm working on. There, there you go, Don. There's a there's a topic for a book for you to write. Um, inter interviewing subjects for fiction. fiction <laughs> I'll let you do that one. You need to do that one. <laughs> What's the topic with the title of your your the book that's being shopped, please? Can you tell us? It, the title, the it's at this point it's still working title. Um, it's called Between the Notes, and it's it's about a um, like I said, she's a she's a former teen pop star, so kind of a Debbie Gips, Gibson ish. Uh, background uh and then she but she becomes she leaves that side and she becomes a producer and engineer and is pretty successful with it but she's facing a music business that is kind of you know what what the music business is right now you know with spotify and youtube kind of just cutting into all the sales so she doesn't know that she's going to have a career much longer and she she winds up working um she she agrees to produce one more album which is this 80s um uh band that kind of came of age with her but she's got some history with them that sounds a great story yeah keep us posted please i will i will <laughs> you know, like i said I, I just talked to my agent last week and she's ready to shop it and i just sent her synopsis and blurb and all of that so cool. Uh, fingers crossed for you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions or stories to share on the topic of interviews? I hope my enthusiasm for this has spread, has uh, rubbed off on you. I oh. really, really talking to people. <laughs> As Elise will know, when she lived in North Carolina, we'd get together for lunch and <laughs> oh, I loved it. I was her. interviewed every week. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I landed Nan. <laughs> True story. 
her first date was a blind date. Um, I worked with her sister at a small newspaper in my hometown and I asked her sister out. She was engaged at the time and I had an extra ticket for a play that I was supposed to review, even though I know nothing about reviewing plays. So I asked Michelle if she'd go with me and her mother said, absolutely not. You're an engaged woman. You're not going anywhere with this guy. So I said, you got a sister, cousin, anybody <laughs> would like to go? So he introduced me to Nan and Nan like had a date blow her off. So she said, agreed to go out with me. And she told me later that apparently I had best basically interviewed her the whole time up to Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> the whole time back to West Palm Beach. And she's like, oh. that had never happened to her before in her life. But it's like, I just like asking people questions. I like getting to know them. So landed me a great wife. <laughs> Don, tell us some more wild stories from crazy. Interviews. I wish I had some. I wish I had more. Um, um, I got crazy stories, not just like about interviewing. But um, I'll tell you one more and then we'll call it a night. But I was doing an article for an Australian magazine about a capybara that escaped from a zoo in West Palm Beach. And um, it just it took off under a fence and there's an extensive canal system in the county and they just dumped in the canal and she was off like a bolt. And she was like missing for months. Occasionally she would pop up and scare the heck out of tourists or something. And they finally caught her. Um, but I did this article about her and I had to get some pictures of a capybara. The magazine was adamant if I couldn't provide photos, they wouldn't be able to run the article. So I went down to the zoo and um, I'm like, I need to take some pictures of your capybaras. And they're like, sure, go ahead. And they let me into the South American compound, which is kind of a, it, down a little bit. And there's all, like railing or up at the top so people can look down on the animals. And there's capybaras and emus and tapirs and all different kinds of South American wildlife there. And so unfortunately, capybaras are extremely skittish animals. So I'm, I'm on my hands and knees with my camera in my hand, just kind of trying to slide up on these capybaras and take their picture before they run away. Meanwhile, Nan is being pestered by a taper. I don't know if you know what a taper is, but it's a, a weird animal with a long ear snout about the size of a cow. And this thing was just wouldn't leave her alone and wouldn't leave me alone. And so she's she's over here scratching the taper on top of the taper's head. I'm over here on my belly like a commando trying to sneak up on skittish capybaras. And at that moment, I looked up and I finally realized, I wonder what these people up here looking down on me are thinking at this very moment. <laughs> And I got the picture and I sold the article. So <laughs> good times, good times. Is there anything else anybody would like to talk about this evening? Dawn? Dawn, yes. can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just put in, uh, when I was in college, uh, back when female rabbis were still fairly new, I wrote a paper about that and got to talk to the very first rabbi and was floored that not only did she answer the phone, but she was thrilled to talk to me. <laughs> and I interviewed several other women rabbis as well. It was, it was really fascinating and a lot of fun and they enjoyed it and I enjoyed it. And that was the first big interview I ever did. And the, the rabbi that, uh, that was my rabbi at Temple Emanuel in, in Manhattan actually complimented me on my interviewing skills and wanted to know where I had learned them. And I had just <laughs> found a book in the library on interviewing. <laughs> and I think coming from a theater background helped with my father, you know, helping me with oral reports oh, yeah. in school. Well, your experience uh, gets to my point of why people will talk to a journalist um, and how sometimes how easy it is to get people that you wouldn't think you'd be able to get. I mean, when I got uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson for military officer, I was just stunned. Of course, he had a book to promote and it was for military officers, so it all made sense. But nonetheless, considering the demands on his time, I was actually surprised that he gave me a, an hour to chat. Um, I wish he had been briefer in his responses, but that was what it was. Um, and then other writers like, you know, Mark, Mark um, uh, Bowden, and C.J. Chivers and, and Nathaniel Philbrick, um, all nonfiction writers at the top of their game. And all of them agreed to talk with me for a Writer's Digest piece. Um, and I mean, I was in seventh heaven with that. I mean, that was one of the most interesting interviews I've ever done with those individuals. So, you know, very often you'll get surprised when somebody says yes. What, one of the nice things about social media and podcasting is you can, um, 
you never know where it's going to come from. I mean, I just, I just did a podcast interview with a guy in Scotland. <laughs> about your book? Um, about your work? Uh, it was it was actually about my memoir this was a fellow he's got a duran duran podcast so i so <laughs> i talked about my memoir but he also has a books pod like he he has several podcasts so he has one just for fiction general fiction so i did one interview for that with kind of my career in general and then i did the other one just specifically for the memoir but but oh, that's the, and awesome. again and this is the nice thing about zoom too because we did this over zoom and he's in scotland and i'm in montana Isn't and that it was awesome, just though? this great transatlantic conversation and, it, and yep. it, it was exactly what you said it was a delightful conversation and we just had a great chat and we really enjoyed it and I work really, really hard on the questions that I ask people and uh, in the interviews I do for ma my magazine work, but I work even harder for the questions I ask the people we get for our TAF talks, Nancy Kress and, and Gary Goldman and, and all of those wonderful, wonderful people. Because I know that there are questions they've been asked a million times before. That's not the question I wanna ask. That's not the insight I'm looking for. I wanna know about this thing over here that has not been talked about a whole lot and their thoughts on that. That to me is what a really effective interview is. When you're covering new ground and, and exposing new information that hasn't been available before, that's what our job is, I think. And that's, that's really the goal of a really good interview. And I work very hard on that. That's how I went about my interviews with the rabbis because I didn't, I get bored by those same questions just as a reader person. Yeah. And then there's always something else that, you know, take it from another, you know, field that's more interesting to me. So I'll tell you other and questions even, that have not been asked. And I think the source appreciates that. I think people are like, oh, crap, not this question again, you know, and they have pat responses to those kinds of questions. You're going to yeah. get the same response that the journalist before you got and the journalist before them got. It's old news. Everybody's seen it. There's no value to that at all. So that's why I think when people, when you ask people questions that they have not been asked before and you're reaching out on areas that they haven't discussed before, it's good for them too. It's really a lot of fun. And I'll tell you some, uh, and this is an admission that I don't think anyone will care about, but early in my career, I was doing a lot of writing where I was interviewing porn stars for some magazines in South Florida. And th this is a cookie cutter situation. You know what I mean? A porn star is a porn star is a porn star. You know what I mean? And so I'd have my questions about the, I have my porn star questions, the usual crap that I had to ask because our, that was our reader was. And it was like, I got so bored with that kind of crap and I could tell they didn't really care at all about this. So I was like, let's talk about politics. What are your thoughts about Clinton? What are your thoughts about this? You know what I mean? And then I just like talk to them about subjects that had nothing to do with their job you know what i mean just to kind of pull them out and give them something unique to talk about and that their eyes would light up and we would have a really fun back and forth on a lot of stuff like that but the weirdest interviews i ever conducted were some of the ones i did when i was working for the tabloids before i got into freelance writing you want to talk bizarre interviews tabloid people are bizarre interviews I would send me to um, UFO conferences and I would talk to these people who would say they had undergone the craziest scenarios and they believed it and they said this was absolute sincerity and I had to interview them as if I believed it too. So that was real interesting. But one of the weirdest ones was I interviewed a, a guy who was like a Bigfoot researcher. And I thought he was really legit. I thought this guy was like a sociologist who was doing something actually sciency until he got to the point where he told me that Bigfoot was astrally projecting into his bedroom while he was in bed to tell him that he was doing an awesome job. And that's when I realized this guy was nuttier than a Chinese chicken salad. <laughs> but we never, we never let that get in the way of a good story. That was a great quote from him right there. That led the article. And then I got to interview a family in, um, in um, um, St. Uh, St. August, St. Augustine, um, whose house had been possessed by a poltergeist. And so that was a real interesting interview also. That was fun. That was, <laughs> so the tabloids were a wild, wild time. That, that was a real educational experience for me, really was. How did you keep yourself from laughing with some of those people? 
Um, I just thought about how my editor would, <laughs> guess my editor would be if I messed this up. You know what I mean? So it's, you're right. You're really, you're like, this guy's crazy. This person in front of me is legitimately insane, but I have to ask him this question and I have to write whatever his answer is because that's my job. And I did my job. It was, it, that's all you can do. That's the way you look at it. Then and I talked to legitimate people too. I mean, you know, actor Lauren Green and, and a bunch of famous people for the tabloids too. So, I mean, here I am talking to the crazy Bigfoot dude. And then over here, I'm talking to, you know, um, legitimate actors. And, and um, I, I interviewed Dr. Ruth and I interviewed, um, um, who was the, the fitness guru dancing to the oldies? Richard Simmons. Oh. Yeah, that kind of stuff. So I, I got a little bit of taste of everything. <laughs> so Don, how do you, if you're writing an article about somebody that your audience doesn't really know their background, how do you balance the, the typical questions about their background that maybe everybody else has asked, asked them with stuff that's new and different and interesting? Uh, you mean, well, so say, so, so say we're, you're interviewing Richard Simmons, but we don't know who Richard Simmons is or, you oh, know, whatever, okay. you know, then right. how do you, well, or then it would be my job to explain in, in either the introduction or at some point, you know, among the first questions I would ask to have him explain to our readers, you know, who he is and what he does. Um, but that kind of information, assuming like, say he was a, a not yet quite famous, but an up and coming mm -hmm. physical fitness guy. You know what I mean? Right. Some people were knowing his reputation's growing, but he's not super famous yet. Then in my introduction to him for the Q&A that would follow, I would explain who he was, what he had done so far. That's what I would do for a lot of the technical interviews I did for Videoscope with uh, behind the camera people on movie sets, like the, the um, Foley um, guy that I, Gary Hacker, the Foley artist I interviewed, special effects makeup guys and stuff like that. I'd give a little bit of their background and then we would segue into the Q&A. And that, you know, that brought everybody up to speed and then we were off to go. I did a profile of Megan Martin, um, who is an American Ninja Warrior, very popular uh, competitor. She's a graduate of Vanderbilt. And so I did a profile of her and I had to explain a little bit in the opening paragraph, you know, she's a Vandy grad, but you know her most, you know, she's done this, but you know her probably best from on American Ninja Warrior. And so that kind of led into the, the interview with her. Did I answer the question? Yeah, I would just, um, I, I don't know. I just was curious because you, I, it makes sense that, you know, you've, people have said the same things a million times, but there are always going to be some readers who don't know who this person is. You absolutely. Know? Sure. So. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so you have to keep both parties in mind, those who are fans of this individual and folks who are interested, but have no idea who that person is. And so it's up to you as the journalist to bring them up to speed, let them know to the degree that they have a vested interest and want to know more and want to read the resulting article. So those opening paragraphs have to be very, very carefully crafted in order to, to say who that person is and then segue directly into the talk itself. Anything else? Anybody? Any stories to share? All right. This has been fun. I guess we will call it an evening then. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. This was great fun. I enjoyed it tremendously. And our guest next month is going to be the managing editor of Vanderbilt Magazine, who is going to talk about writing for uh, alumni publications, because that is a potentially lucrative market out there that a lot of writers really don't know about. So I look forward to seeing you all then. And thanks a lot. Catch you all later. Thank you. Good night, guys. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye.